guesswork is the cancer of all business. All too often, the issue that we see when it comes to optimization is they're guessing too much. They just don't know what's working. They don't know what's not working. Remove the S work and suddenly answers tend to appear a lot more readily. Hello, welcome to another episode of Test, Optimize and Scale. Bringing a huge episode to you today. I've been looking forward to it all week. We have the privilege of, of Charles Godet joining us here, CEO of Predictable Profits, author of the Predictable Profits Playbook. He's the head of coaching for, for Forbes, Rolling Stone, Fast Company. The, the list goes on and, and takes companies onto the Inc. 5000, seven, eight figure CEOs. We're going to be able to speak about it in depth today with Charles. Charles, thanks for taking the time to join. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I know I'm just scratching the surface with your accolades and want to familiarize the audience with your story, with your path into the creation of predictable profits. But uh, you know, starting where it all began for you. Sure. So a lot of people think that entrepreneurs are born entrepreneurs. Um, that was a, that might be true for some people, but it's not true for me. Uh, my dad. Uh, was an entrepreneur and he worked every waking hour of every day. Uh, in other words, he'd be up and out the door before I got out of bed in the morning. And then he'd be, he'd come home after I went to bed. Uh, so I rarely saw him. But when I did see him, he would tell me, hey kid, if you ever wanna make something of yourself, you gotta be an entrepreneur. And so I'm four years old and I wanted my father's attention. And so I started my first business at the age of four. I was selling our work to my neighbors. And while I did it to ultimately earn my father's affection and his attention, I got the entrepreneurial bug from there. And so never had a traditional real job. After college, I started a business nominated by Ernst & Young as being one of the nation's best seed stage companies. At 24, I created my first multi-million dollar business. From there, I continued to build and grow a number of different companies until 2010. That's when somebody offered to pay me to help them grow their company. and. Uh, I thought, huh, the heck, well, this would be interesting. And um, before long, uh, I started Predictable Profits. And so uh, we've been predominantly working with seven, eight-figure CEOs, though we do have a few nine-figure CEOs, uh, brands you would know that we work with. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. I mean, typically people are coming to us looking for one of three things. They're saying, you know, what's it going to take to grow my company faster? Or maybe they say, some months are feast, some months are famine. How do we bring more predictability into our revenue? Well, the third one is, hey, look, the company is just far too dependent on me. How do we scale? Those are the three core areas that we focus on. And, you know, the rest is history, I guess. Well, I think we have a lot in common on our day-to-day -day and the types of organizations we work with. Sounds like you're working with companies that are much further along as well. Um, and uh, my, my father uh, became an entrepreneur for that same reason of seeing me in the morning, seeing me at night. Uh, but but it happened for him uh, after I was two, three years old. So that story really resonates with me. I, I did not have the uh, uh, background of creating a business at four. That, that That's huge. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, first multi million dollar business at 24 in 2010, starting to work with others to, to do that. And then with, with my understanding of what you guys do at Predictable Profits, which would love to get more into the studies and some sure. of the stats, some of the numbers that you guys are finding, uh, you know, very impressed by what, uh, you know, you're doing, how you're impacting entrepreneurs and the, the community that we work in as well on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but love the, you know, grow faster, more predictable, uh, projections and models to get there because every founder wants to have a, a bigger company, generally speaking, but they don't sure. always have a roadmap, let alone an algorithmic roadmap to get there uh, sure. or anything to depend on, let alone predict. So that access to scale, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into. Uh, but but you know, going back to predictable profits, I understand you guys work with seven, eight, nine-figure CEOs there. What do you do and what type of, of data, what type of statistics are you putting out there based on the high volume of founders you speak with? You know, in terms of like the statistics, um, what I could tell you is when we look at business owners, anyone that comes to us and they say um, that their business 
is predominantly word of mouth and referrals, which just so happens, by the way, to be most most companies or they built their business through word of mouth and referrals. I always tend to go into my crystal ball and I say, okay, without you even telling me your revenue at this point, I am going to guess that you're somewhere between one and three million. And almost always, if they're an established organization, but they've built their business predominantly through word of mouth and referrals, 19 out of 20 times, it's going to be a pretty accurate that they're going to be within that one to three million dollar range. Now, there are some outliers. And recently, I spoke to somebody who said, well, I'm doing 38 million a year. I said, well, that's interesting. And he says, well, I came from the industry and I took all my clients from you know the, the company that I worked for and brought them in and now I'm 38 million. But he was concerned because you know six clients made up $38 million. So it was one and, and that becomes an yes. issue. But you know, for for companies, um, when we look at how do we not only uh, grow faster, but create more predictability in our revenue, um, there are two different strategies. You can grow fast and not predictably. Uh, you can grow predictably and you, can, you're, you may not be growing fast. There's often confusion between that. You see, if it's, if it's just about speed and growth at all costs, there's a reason why 66% of companies who make it on the Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies list within five to eight years of getting listed will go out of business, shrink in size, uh, or be disadvantageously sold. And that's because they have not put the scalability into their business. And the company takes off and grows faster than the CEO's or leadership's ability to stay in front of it. And so the business can only grow up to the capability of the leaders. And if it if momentum takes over and it surpasses it, eventually it changes direction. And it's like catching a falling knife. Oftentimes it falls faster than leadership's ability to, to change that. So a lot of times... Um, will tell the uh, the CEOs the ultimate objective is that sustainable growth. But when you follow a process, what we call the OSI method, and it's great that it, this is where you and I think very similar test optimize scale. You know, our philosophy is what we call the OSI method: optimize, systematize, and then innovate. So when you optimize something, oftentimes you do make one little twist, one little turn. And then you start to see some of that explosive growth, which is even more exciting. Through the theory of optimization, it really boils down to do more of what's working and less of what's not. And so you find something that's working and it's like, okay, how do we put a little more rocket fuel on that? And then boom, it just really takes off. And you know, every year we put companies on the Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies list and they all think, you know, what is that magic sauce that super strategy you have and so forth. And it's like, I hate to really bore you with this, but it really comes down to optimization, systemization, innovation. See, once you optimize, you get it fine-tuned, then you put it into a system. And the reason why you put it into a system is because, you know, we need to create that scalable growth. And if you don't put it into a system, you're going to forget to do it. We worked with this one woman. We built a system for her. It allowed her to increase her month-to-month -month sales by 100%. Phenomenal. Super exciting. Years passed. Asked her how the campaign is running. And she goes, oh, my God, I can't believe I forgot to run it again. Because it wasn't put into a system. But once you have it systematized, then you don't have to think about it anymore. Things just start to happen automatically. It frees up your time. And because now it frees up your time, it gives you the opportunity to innovate. And through that innovation, it's, okay, how do we create a new profit center? How do we create, you know, a, a new revenue model? Um, and then you go through that cycle again. We created something new. Now let's optimize. Now let's systematize. And now let's innovate. And so, you know, that's sort of, I guess, where we're looking at. If you look at bringing that predictability into your growth and looking at sustainable growth, and you look at it from the, from the, uh, eyes of optimization, systemization, and innovation, the fast growth will take care of itself. On the flip side of the coin, if you just focus in on the fast growth, then without the optimization, without the systemization, without the innovation, 
you know, it's uh, it's going to burn bright and fast and then put itself out, you know, pretty quickly as well. You could definitely have that falling knife and, and love the predictability you have working with so many different founders to say yes, probably one in three million if it's just the word of mouth and referrals. Unfortunately, 66%, Inc. 5,000 companies that are growing the fastest don't look so good five years later. And yes, optimize, systemize, innovate, big fan of that. Uh, I got involved on the marketing side because we could be at the forefront of an organization's growth. I saw products, businesses, underutilized marketing and, and essentially die. It, of course, yeah. has to be done right. I got yeah. an attraction towards advertising around 2010, 2011 because of the ability to optimize, because we were able to build audiences, creatives, funnels, have the data show us what's working, look to identify pockets of performance and create opportunities to scale. I love the aspect of systemize because I could bottleneck things if I'm the only one doing that and I need a system. So whether it's me, advertising director, you know, media buyer underneath them, they can go through those same processes and, you know, can have, hey, you need this much traffic, you need this much time before you make optimizations to this stage of the algorithm, being able to have that. And then a system, even just getting time on the books to innovate. I mean, it could be one of the things that gets deprioritized with, with client partner demands, other things that are occurring on a day to day. So I, I really like your stack there. Um, I, I'm driven to your point around innovation. What, what are the best approaches to innovation? Do you need you know, a creative director? Do you need a product expert to sit around and have a whiteboard? Are there different steps that you've seen to be the most productive towards innovating? Sure. Well, there's innovation can happen in multiple different ways, right? We can look at innovation from a product standpoint, like mm -hmm. how do we create a new product line or how do we improve the existing product that we have now? And so there is an element of innovation that goes that way. If we're looking at it from strictly a revenue perspective, then usually what we'll do is we'll say, you know, how do we play off of the existing momentum that we currently already have? Mm. So, you know, for example, um, let's say that um, you're running a outbound campaign. Now, most people don't realize that outbound is a category. It's not a strategy. It, it, with outbound, there are multiple different strategies that are inside of outbound marketing. And so you could take an outbound marketing strategy and you could run a strategy um, for example, we have one strategy that we call our market research method, where you're interviewing other, you know, prospects and you uh, collect information, you put together a market research study and, and so forth. And that helps to start the conversation and progressively uh, drive appointments and say that goes really, really well. When you go to the innovation, the innovation stage is, okay, now I have a market research report and it's resonating really well. Now what I can do is I can create a landing page and I can get people to download the market research report and I could throw some paid media behind it and I could do that. That could be one area of the landing page because we're going to leverage the existing momentum. The other thing that we could look at is we could say, okay, now that we have that, what are different ways that we can piggyback off that existing momentum? Uh, another potential strategy might be you know, uh, what we call the sniper method. And that is very intent-based outbound approach where you're able to identify the people who are visiting your website and the companies visiting your website. And then that just gives you an other approach to be able to aggressively reach out to those folks as well. And so now you went from market research, now you have a landing page, now you have a sniper method, you just added three more spokes to the wheel. And now you're saying, well, now, you know, we need to do more. And you might be thinking of different pieces of sales enablement. You might, you know, whatever that might be. I mean, one of the ways that we'll, we'll take companies is uh, we'll oftentimes ask them to flow chart the relationship between sales and marketing. And I want to see from the very beginning, from the entry points that somebody comes into the website, 
flow chart that all the way down. But even further than that, I want you to break it down into the five different levels of awareness. You know, I want you to break it down so that we understand what about the people that are completely unaware that may have just visited a blog on uh, on your website. You know, what is the pathways that they go through? And how do you bring them from being completely unaware to say now they're more solution aware? And when they're solution or problem aware, rather, they're unaware and then they go to problem aware, meaning now they recognize that they have a problem, but they're not sure of their solution. And what are the different ways that you're supporting them through that cycle? Then you go down to solution aware. Then you go down to product aware. Then you go down to most aware. And when people look at it that way, most of the time they look at me like, and their eyes are glossed over and they're going, I don't understand a single thing that is being said right now. But as we explain the different parts that go through a, a buyer's journey, the different decisions that have to be made, the different uh, milestones that have to be met in the decision-making journey, because everybody is going to be in a different cycle. When we look back and they say, I want to grow my company faster, then we say, awesome. Each one of those cycles has their own different KPI. What is the KPI here? What is the KPI here? What is the KPI here? And then we're able to pinpoint with laser precision accuracy, your issue is actually in this part right here, and we can fix it. See, off, here's a, a classic example. We had a publishing company that came to us. And they said, um, we need more leads. And oftentimes, the question that you're asking yourself is not actually the right question to be asking. The question, you know, Tony Robbins, I traveled the world with him for a while. And uh, not as a groupie, I, I actually had to pay him to travel the world with him, right? So uh, travel the world with him for a little bit. And, you know, he says, you want better answers, ask better questions. So we had asked better questions. And the question is, so, you know, why aren't you getting more leads? And of the leads that you're getting, are they converting? And if they're not converting, where are you losing them? And what happened was he got to a place where he said to me, I need more leads. And if I took him for face value and just gave him more leads, he never would have solved the problem. His marketing would have been far more inefficient and only would have exacerbated the problem. Right. So we had to put it through these different buckets. And as we went through the buckets, I said, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. what's happening here? When we go from this phase to this phase, there's a massive drop off in conversion. I goes, huh? Oh my God. What do you think is going on? Well, I don't know. That's what we call a check engine light. Now we have to open the hood and see what's actually going on. Let's look at it deeper. So he said, okay, so what happens? Well, they schedule on my calendar link. Okay, good. So they schedule on your calendar link. What happens from there? Um, well, they should be getting reminders. I said, okay, but are they? I don't know. Okay, should and knowing are two different things. Let's take a look at it. And when he looked, he goes, they're not getting any reminders. You go, huh, isn't that interesting? So they're scheduling. Are they getting a confirmation email? No, they're not. Something as simple as that, once we fixed that, all of a sudden he realized he didn't need more leads. In fact, he had more leads that his sales team could handle and they had to scale back their marketing and actually reduce their leads by more than half. This is why optimization is so important. And you, gotta, you have to know the data at every single stage so you know where the leaks are in your buckets so you can solve it. People are co oftentimes complaining, oh, Google AdWords costs so much. My cost per lead is so high. It's like, wait a minute. Is it Google AdWords or is there other problems in there? So, I mean, we could keep going on and on and on. But yeah. you ask different questions, you're going to get different answers. And you have to be asking the right questions, as you mentioned. You, you could be focusing on volume when there's, you know, fundamental disconnects occurring 
I mean, not getting the reminder emails, not getting these other pieces to boost conversion rate. But I think it all comes from that breakdown of uh, we call it the marketing funnel, exactly as you're mentioning with the flow, with the five stages, knowing your key performance indicators, your KPIs for each stages, knowing how many audience members you're looking to convert from one stage to the next and looking to have those increases. Uh, I've been asked about growth hacking quite a bit. I've been been on stage and they say, hey, you're going to be on this panel around growth hacking. I said, well, to, to growth hack, you really have to have a growth model. And it should really be predictable as you know, you're know really highlighting here. Otherwise, you can't hack it. You don't even know mm. where you're going yet. So how are you measuring? And the only way to measure is with numbers. How many visitors to your, your site, your funnel are you anticipating? How many leads are, are you looking to get out of that? What type of closing rate are you looking at for each conversion from the leads from there? Uh, how do you know what your audiences uh, are thinking, what they want at each of those stages? So let's take a step back. You know, who are your different audiences uh, that you're A-B testing and variant testing and looking to get the best performance from? And so when I hear uh, a scale conversation, I hear a growth conversation, whether it's associated with profits, what, whether it's, you know, j- just a, a marketing chat and, you know, around audience growth. I need to know the exact steps, how it's working right now, how it's been validated, and then how you're going to scale it. Uh, I love how you brought up outreach, advertising. I I like channels that can be intentionally moved and increased. Mm -hmm. It's great to get a, a, a publisher to cover you and you have an article or have an influencer post, but if there's not any access to to replicate and, and with systems and with a defined timeline, you're, you're, you're kind of hoping peer-to-peer marketing gets you there. And if your audience is big enough, maybe, but it's like you said, you got to be able to ask the right questions, see, see what's physically moving. I think that was a great breakdown of how to innovate where <clears throat> you're, you're watching what's already occurring and then building on top of that, not looking to reinvent the wheel as much as how can we make the wheel run smoother? How do we add that landing page? How do we, in addition to outreach, run you know, other traffic sources, maybe advertising there? I think that's a great way to look at it. Awesome. <laughs> I like to think so. <laughs> now, you were talking about that one to three million level. Yeah. How do you go past that? What, where do you see founders get stuck? And what's the difference from that 66% that end up losing the traction at some point and the ones that are able to continue thriving into higher levels of market share? Got it. Great question. Uh, and there's a number of different ways to do that. But we're going to start with, you know, at the very basic level, the most common one is you got to think in terms of scalability scalable marketing and sales systems. See, right before we hit record in this podcast, you had asked me about the formula, right? What is the formula and how do we do it? And we realized that it's really broken down into three main areas. It's the setup. And the setup is all the areas in which you create, capture, and nurture demand. So that's our setup. Then we have sales. And sales is all the way in which you're qualifying, uh, your your leads, how you're closing and converting those leads and how you're getting them to buy more from you, whether we're talking MRR, ARR, and so forth. Then you have scaling components and scaling components are all about data intelligence, having the right organizational structure, removing the guesswork and optimization and all that other fun stuff, right? So it's set up sales and scale. And when we look at taking a company beyond that one to three million mark, there's a section in each one of those areas. So the first one is, how are you creating demand right now? How are you creating demand? And for most companies between one and 3 million, that's like, well, word of mouth and referrals and we get some SEO. It's like, okay, I understand. Now what we have to do is think in terms of scalability. How do we create more demand? And through then once we create, then we can capture that demand and nurture that demand and so forth. And there's systems for each, but it really comes down to how are, we've got to create more demand that goes beyond word of mouth and referrals because you really just can't scale word of mouth and referrals. And we saw that during the pandemic when the pandemic really just hit us hard. People were so concerned about taking care of themselves. They weren't really doing a good job about referring people to others. So it's great demand. Then we look at the sales side. And if you're in a service-based business, 
then it's about you know selling and when i say selling most businesses that are one to three are still doing founder-led sales so how do you then create and build a sales team and that sales team not only is about just having somebody else who's going to close but what about that other element of prospecting and business development and whatnot? What is that going to look like? Because we want to have those multiple spokes in the wheel, build robustness into the organization. And for a lot of founder-led sales, several of them have actually tried to hire other salespeople. And unfortunately, they failed miserably. And they failed miserably because what happened was, is they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we are going to put an ad up on LinkedIn and we're going to get a whole bunch of applicants and we're going to look for people that have industry experience and a stacked resume. And then we're going to bring them in and we're going to say, okay, here's your quota. Go get them, Tiger. And then that salesperson is going to fail at the job. And the reason why they're going to fail is because likely there's inadequate management both from the pipeline and in terms of just overall what a sales manager should do to bring out the best in the salesperson. There's no sales playbook at all. So there's no playbook, no official guide to handle objections, um, how to appropriately um, you know, walk somebody through the sales conversation. There's none of that. So just kind of winging it. And there's a lot of guesswork in there. Um, and a lot of times when it comes to hiring, they just don't even don't know how to hire. They don't know how the right interview questions to ask and so forth. You know, how does a salesperson handle objections? Many salespeople, even though they've been in the industry for a while, um, they don't have any real formal training and they just bring relationships from one business to another to another. And that's how a lot of salespeople end up working. So all of that, that process has to be built in play. And then on the scale side, one of the most common things when we look at one to $3 million businesses when, you know, in the very beginning, you're doing all the work yourself, all the work yourself. Then you go, okay, you know what? I can't do everything. I need to start bringing in more people. So the first type of people that you hire are 1099s, all subcontractors. You subcontract everything. And then you get to a point where you realize, wait a minute, those people are using me as a means to an end. I am their client. And so they don't have the same passion for my business as I do. Um, they work their billable hours and they're not just as invested. And there are going to be limitations to the growth that you have with 1099s. And you make the decision, you know what? I need to start bringing in some W-2s, some full-time employees. But your first hires when you start bringing in employees are usually, I am going to spend the least amount of money I can on the most qualified person that I can afford. But when you bring in, say, a C player, what happens is your ratio is it usually takes, if you're going to invest a dollar in a C player, you might get anywhere between a dollar and a dollar fifty back in return. Actually not making a lot of money on that hire. You might be freeing yourself up more with time, but you're not making a lot of money on that hire. And you have a little bit more headaches, your onboarding takes a little bit longer. You're not getting massive results. Then you decide, I think I'm going to have to hire somebody who has a higher skill level. So now you go to a B player. Now, all of a sudden, now you hired a B player. And every dollar you spend, now you're making two and a half dollars more on this person. So now it's like, all right, now I'm starting to cook with oil. Like, this is, this is great. Now, now I'm cooking with oil. This is awesome. And then you go, wow, if this is that good, and I know that to get to the next level, I'm going to have to bring in an A player. What would the impact of an A player be on my organization? And when you bring in the A player, all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I went from a, you know, two and a half to one, I, I make two and a half dollars to now I'm making five, 10 times more money on an A player and sometimes more. In fact, the interesting thing is you're bringing in an A player and you're ROIing on that A player sometimes within the first few weeks. I have a client right now that made the decision to bring in an A player. This A player costs multiple six figures a year. 
super expensive. But the difference was in the first 17 days, he nearly made and earned his entire salary for the year in the first 17 days. Crazy. But that's the difference between bringing in an A player, B player, C player, or just subcontracting it all out. The multiples that you break down for the A, B, C player, I haven't heard it articulated in that fashion before. Again, to the audience, I, I know, Charles, this isn't just from your firsthand experience, which I imagine the majority of it is, but but just the stats that you guys get from, from all of the agencies that give this type of info, all the companies that do. And again, I, I think that really projects the message there of not just going at a contractor. Uh, we're in California. We, we have to have employees for everybody, not just going at who you could afford, but but going for that talent. Yeah. going for the a player asking the right questions in the interview so you're not just paying for the most expensive person you're finding the best fit almost aside from the compensation but finding that a performer and a, then yes the mindset change you're looking at it in the beginning you're looking at it as an expense i'm hiring somebody it's an expense but then you change your mindset and you go i'm making an investment yes so, you know, the question for you, you know, Jason, when you're making an investment, do you want to make an investment and make, you know, invest a dollar or make a dollar? Is that the type of investment that you're comfortable with? Or would you rather make a invest a dollar or make 10? We work in investor marketing. Uh, it's what we're known for. And we're driving investors to early stage opportunities. They all want to see some pretty aggressive multiples, high, high risk, high return sections of the portfolio. So you're, you're, you're speaking my language and yes, looking at it an investment versus an expense, uh, looking at it long-term versus just, ah, what do I have to pay right out of the gate here? And, and having, you know, that predictability, making projections, being able to say, we want a five to 10 X return on this team member. We need to set them up for success. Here's the model they're going to be operating within inside this organization. Yep. For sure. And are these the type of tactics that you use to get early stage companies into the right rhythm to get onto the Inc. 5000? I know you've worked with the high volume of companies that have gone on to the Inc. 5000. Yeah, I mean, more or less, everybody goes through the same model. It's just sometimes some people have other things set up better than, you know, other things. Everybody's components are a little bit different. Um, but everybody goes through the, the same model. I mean, we're in a very unique situation in that we work with some of the best and brightest entrepreneurs on the planet. They're, all their services and their products are world-class, but they just got to a point where they're juggling so many balls in the air that they just need somebody to say, all right, what, what do I need to focus in on next? Yeah. And, and it's only because they're doing so much that they just need somebody to say, all right, just let me just sort through. It's sort, I, I, don't need, I don't need more to do. I just need to know what to do. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it does go down to the, you know, to the model itself. I mean, every situation is, you know, is so different. Um, there's, uh, I think one of my favorite examples actually happens to be uh, in the middle of COVID. You know, Jason, when we think about the hardest hit industries in COVID, what are some of the industries that you think of that were like absolutely decimated? I could tell you here in Los Angeles, it was physical retail and restaurants, oh, yeah. uh, you know, food and beverage stand out to me from there. Yeah. Food and beverage travel, mm -hmm. right? Travel completely halted for a long period of time and even slowed down. I remember traveling the next year and places uh, had not seen uh, tourism in over 12 months at that point. Uh, now, I want you to imagine something. Put yourself in the situation of this CEO. <clears throat> Uh, he runs an international travel company with offices all around the world. He only gets paid when he puts somebody on a plane to have them leave out of the country. And now all of a sudden, planes are grounded mm -hmm. and business comes to a screeching halt. 
You envy him at all, by chance? <laughs> <laughs> Not in that moment. Not in that moment. He calls me up. He was so stressed out, he went to his parents' house. He FaceTimes me. His hair is all disheveled. You could tell he was not sleeping well. Hair's all disheveled. Yeah. And he said, uh, hi, Charlie. Um, I just need you to just, just give me your word, and then, uh, and then I'll take care of it. I go, what are you talking about? He says, just tell me I'm out of business, and I'll close everything down. So why would you do why would you do that? Well, I mean, I I can't put people on planes. Business came to a screeching halt. I there's I mean, there's there's nothing we can do. I mean, we're we're bleeding money. We got offices all around the all around the world with bleeding money. We can't keep this going on for long. So uh yeah, all I'm doing is I'm just calling you to ask your permission, your blessing for no other reason. Should I close the company down? I said, I'm, you know what? I'm confused. You know, from my viewpoint, I'm looking at this saying, this could be one of the best times in the world for you to be in business. And he looks at me through the FaceTime and he's going, I don't think you understand anything that I just told you. I said, let me ask you a question before you go ahead and you shut things down. You know, you talk about optimization, Jason, right? Yep. So I said, before you shut things down, let me ask you a question. Are people opening your emails? He said, yeah. Okay. Are they clicking on the links? Yeah. No, they're clicking on the links. Okay. You think they would travel if they had the opportunity to travel? Well, yeah, but they can't. Right. But they will at some point, right? He goes, yeah. But you're faced with three decisions. You change the message to meet the market. You change the market to meet the message, or you change both the message and the market. What we're seeing right here is people want to travel, but they can't. But what if we change the message? What if we said the border should shut down, everybody's in the same situation, but what if you reserve your travel plans now? This way, when the borders open up, you will be among the first to get out the door, beat the rush, and we'll be able to work with you and plan this trip. So it is completely magical throughout this throughout this time. And you have something to look forward to when all this gas is over. He says, let's do it. I got nothing to lose at this point. After that, he broke every daily sales record he ever had. Broke weekly sales records. Broke monthly sales record had the highest online sales that he had ever had in the history of his company, all while not putting a single person on the plane. His competitors doing over $200 million a year were going out of business. Sure. He instantly became the number one largest and fastest growing company in his niche in the entire world. And now that we're a few years out of the pandemic, he still holds that title. Pretty remarkable. Talk it's about innovation. Changing. It's innovation. It's changing your mindset. It's looking at different questions. And it still starts with optimization. Because mm -hmm. you have to ask different questions. Instead of how do I sell more? Let's look at what's working. People are clicking. People are opening emails. People are clicking links. That means they really do want to buy, but they don't think they can. Mm -hmm. So let's change the message and see what happens. And you're looking at that flow, the awareness, you're, you're seeing, yeah. hey, hey, the audience is there and they're responding. They're not converting. They're not purchasing for these reasons. What if we change up the messaging for this market and see what happens? And I've actually seen some of the, uh, the best results on campaigns from that got nothing to lose mentality. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a freedom that comes with that and a blank canvas and what you're, you're painting on there. Uh, and to hear that that worked and what it did, and I imagine how it continued to uh, align with the audience's mindset once the borders did open. And I was in one of those earlier groups that told you how great it was. And I remember the travel partners at that point. It probably created a better synergy for the brand among, uh, among their customers thereafter. So yeah. uh, great example. Um, and like you said, what a difficult time 
unlike what I had ever experienced before in the pandemic, uh, in many industries, like you said, this one being hit uh, as part of the toughest, you know, this shows that growth mentality um, and, and man, even being able to, to build those traffic patterns and predictability in a, a tough period like that. Uh, it's impressive. It's a great example. Um, it's uh, It was definitely pretty cool. And Charles, I want to package some actionable insights, some more ideas that you have for listeners, for viewers. You're giving us such great information. I got two pages of notes myself that I'm going to be reviewing with the team and quoting you on to different clients. We're always looking to see a higher success rate uh, across early stage organizations, across on entrepreneurs. Uh, what could they test out towards their own model? This could be in terms of marketing, could be in terms of growth. Or even just in terms of predictability and building, uh, you know, the the right systems internally to have that more sustainable growth. That's a really good question. So, um, at a high level, we've known that as of November 2022, we went from a buyer acquisition phase to a demand creation phase. And by that, the sales cycle was relatively short going up to November 2022. But then after that, the sales cycle got significantly longer. We had a more discer discerning buyer and so forth. And so they're just needing more information before they made a smart decision. Your competitor used to be, let's say you're an agency owner, your competitor used to be other agencies. Now your competitor is really anybody who wants access to that $1 that you have left. And so it's you have competition all over the place. So when we're dealing with a uh, discerning buyer, one of the things that we discovered is that it's consumption that drives conversion. Consumption drives conversion. So it's interesting because uh, a really, really well-known marketer I was on the phone with, and uh, he was asking me questions about how do I shorten my sales cycle? And I said, uh, well, you know, consumption drives conversion. So let's, we got to figure out more ways to drive that con consumption, whether, you know, we get them to consume more emails, to consume more videos, to uh, consume more retargeting and more messaging. The more they see you, the more they do this. So hold on. He looks in his data and he goes, seven hours. I go, what does that mean? He said, our buyer, our average person stays in our list for 186 days, but more. what's more fascinating than that is it's seven hours. It takes seven hours of consumption before somebody makes a purchase. And he goes, huh, I'm looking at it the wrong way. Instead of looking at 186 days, I need to look at how do we get people to consume more content? So and that is his one example. We found that for marketing qualified leads, MQLs, 7.5% um, of MQLs will convert between zero and 90 days, but 42.5% uh, of MQLs will buy something between you know 90 days and two years from now. And the big difference between what about those people in the first three months versus those people at the end, it comes down to consumption. The more content they consume, the better. So you want to create a consumption strategy, whether that's social selling and making sure that you're connecting with people and they're seeing your content on a regular basis. And we just had a gentleman reach out today and go, you know what? I was thinking about getting a business coach and you showed up in my feed. And so I'd like to talk to you guys. Um, and then the retargeting to stay top of mind and build that share, uh, share of voice. That is a critical part. If you're not doing retargeting, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, and then just making sure you're persistent with your sharing great high value, you know, communication over to your list. But it comes down to that consumption drives conversion. And the practical example of how that worked was I decided on Thursday that, you know what, maybe I'm going to buy that remarkable tablet. Maybe I'll buy a remarkable tablet. I mean, it seems cool. When I go on the website and I'm like, oh, it's $550. Do I really want to spend $550? I mean, I have an iPad. Maybe I'm just wasting money. I don't need it. So I shut down the browser. Then that night, I see the re remarkable ad. I ignored it the first time. The following morning, I open up my iPhone and I see the remarkable ad again. I still I still ignore it. Almost every time I check Facebook or Instagram, remarkable ad pops back up again. And by lunchtime, all of a sudden, I find myself clicking on the remarkable ad because now it says the top six reasons why. So I start sorting through the remarkable ad. This is on Friday. At this point, I've seen a lot of remarkable ads. 
And by Saturday morning, I said to my wife, we need to go buy Best Buy. She said, why? I go, I got to get my hands in this remarkable tablet <laughs> and see why it's so remarkable. But what they did is they really focused in on that consumption strategy. Like most people, they will say, oh, I jumped on the phone with this person or I tried to schedule an appointment and they either didn't buy or they didn't schedule. And so they're probably not interested. I'm not going to bother them. They'll reach out when they come time. Or they'll say, I've added them to my list and I'll send them my broadcast email that goes out once a week, once every other week or whatnot. And they'll think that's enough. And then you're going to get those people who are a little bit more strategic. And they're going to say, they didn't buy because they didn't consume enough. I, they now are going to go into my consumption strategy. I'm going to engage in social selling. So they see me everywhere on my social platforms and we're going to be retargeting them. We're going to send high value communication. Before long, boom, 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 boom. Pipeline gets full and they start selling at a more consistent clip. And uh, so that's what I would be testing. I would be saying, you know what? You want to test something? Test your consumption strategy. Drive more consumption. Consumption drives conversion. Consumption drives conversion. I, I think of consumption as the product itself. And as you're mentioning, it's actually the content. It can be an article, yeah. a video, uh, you know, anything yeah. that you're putting out there. The seven hours, I, I normally say seven touch points or more. I say seven to 17. I, I really look at point at higher numbers at this point. I, I The seven hours, that, that's a good time spent. It's a good breakdown and it shows the importance of making that content, making each of those touch points engaging to keep them in and, and really make mm -hmm. that consumption a good thing. No one likes consuming a bad product, let alone a piece of content. And yes, that that retargeting, that persistence, bringing them back, it's really all in that follow-up. I point at these stats of how many uh, biz dev, how many sales folks never follow up and how many only follow up a few times and how conversions actually happen much later in the cycle uh, and, and you know, the, the reverse in the, the line of thinking as a whole. What about optimization? And I know this is a big part uh, of your models, of your systems. What do you do when things are not working? You know, sometimes founders will, will watch a piece of content, they'll read an article, hey, this sounds easy, let me just apply it. But I think it really comes down to the problem solving and, and this area uh, of the business, the optimization that, that separates the groups that are, are leading a vertical. How do you talk to a founder who, who's who's testing you know out their consumption model uh it, it's not fully working what are the best ways to approach that to be able to manage to a point of effectiveness got it most of the time it's asking different questions you know if you're running a um if you're running a strategy and you're not getting the right consumption the easiest thing is to say the strategy doesn't work but it's like well wait a minute what is not working is it the message that's not working because it could possibly be the message that's not working. Maybe we have to ask different questions. You know, so different questions produce different answers. Um, the more common thing when it comes to the optimization is make sure you're tracking the right data. Um, you know, and on the consumption side of things, you know, part of the data that we're going to be tracking is uh, if we're showing videos, you know, and it's running through uh, social media, like what is our cost per consumption? You, know, you want that under a dollar, you know, ideally. Uh, or are people even consuming it for that matter? Um, you know, you want to track uh, the different engagement uh, throughout your process to see are people engaging and watching and reading and all this other fun stuff, are people seeing it, you know, that's type of the metrics. But yeah, I mean, optimization, it's all going to be varied across the board. The I, I would say my saying for a while has been guesswork is the cancer of all business. All too often, the issue that we see when it comes to optimization is they're guessing too much. They just don't know what's working. They don't know what's not working. Um, remove the S work and suddenly answers tend to appear a lot more readily. I know in that data, asking the right questions, as you were mentioning earlier, often looking in the wrong spots. Uh, and then lastly, what, what about scale? How does a company that that's seeing their model work take it to higher levels, maybe quicker than the model uh, they had initially initially mapped out. Uh, you know, what are some success stories, examples, or, or any you know, secrets towards scale that you can uh, point towards for audiences? Yeah, you know, like you said, there's many different components of scale itself. Um, 
uh, you have to have the right systems in place in order to scale so that you leave for very little variation and it's a lot easier for other people to take over and do it or automation take over and do it. So systems are incredibly essential for scale. Um, but also the other thing is just looking at it from a perspective of optimization, which is do more of what's working, less of what's not. You do more of what's working and that's the easiest way to scale. There you go. Increase the uh, highest performing segments. Charles, this has been a delight. I'm really enjoying the discussion. As we begin to wrap things up here, I want to ask the final question of, of any final thoughts you want to leave listeners with. And what's the best way to get them in, in contact with your content so they could begin consuming with, with your team if they want more, more depth after today's podcast? Awesome. Uh, you know, I would recommend people uh, take a look over at the Predictable Profits Playbook. Um, we just did a revised version. It's the one with the green cover over on Amazon. Uh, the black cover was my older version, but uh, we just did the, a new updated version that will give people some concepts and some ideas on you know, how we approach growing and scaling different companies. You can also check us out over at predictableprofits.com. Again, that's predictableprofits.com and all the different you know social media channels, either for myself, Charles Goodhead, or Predictable Profits. I mean, at the end of the day, um, it really just comes down to uh, growing uh, a company is is quite um, simple in, in nature. It's less about the fast growth. The fast growth will come. It's more about building that sustainable growth. And that sustainable growth happens in by leveraging three buckets. Bucket number one is setup. How are you creating, capturing, and nurturing demand? Bucket number two is sales. You know, making sure that you're qualifying, nurturing. I mean, you're qualifying, you're closing, and that you're bringing people back to continue buying from you. And then there's the scale part. Do you have the right data? Do you have the right team in place? Do you have the right, you know, systems? And and that's the 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 scale component. So, uh, set up sales and scale. Predictableprofits.com. I think that pretty much uh, says it all right there. There you go. Boom. Charles, thank you so much for taking the time to hop on the podcast. They say, uh, you know, to, to to seek out others who have been down your path. And I, I think this gives the information of, uh, you know, what could occur ahead to founders in, in a very informative way. So very much appreciate you taking time to hop on the pod today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Charles. And thanks again to, to listeners, to viewers. Appreciate you tuning in. Hope you got out a lot out of today's episode. Definitely recommend you get in touch with Predictable Profits, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.